the next topic we need to cover when we're talking about Section 351, non-recognition of gain or loss, is the assumption of liabilities. A corporation, as we know, in 351, a corporation takes property and issues shares. That's very simple if the property is owned outright, but sometimes the property is encumbered by debt. And as we know, when we receive shares, we don't receive cash, so we don't really have the means to pay off the debt. So a lot of the times the corporation will assume those liabilities. So they will take over paying those liabilities for their shareholders in return and give them stock. Section 357 of the code is up here on your slide. It says in A, the general rule, except as provided in B and C, if the taxpayer receives property which would be permitted to be received under 351 or 361 without the recognition of gain, if it were the sole consideration, and as part of the consideration, another party to the exchange assumes a liability of the taxpayer, such assumption shall not be treated as money or other property and shall not prevent the exchange from being within the provisions of 351 or 361 as the case may be. So our general rule says... If the corporation assumes the liability of the shareholder, that's okay. If all the other parts of Section 351 are satisfied, this is not going to kick it out of 351 non-recognition. But there is B and C, so B, tax avoidance purpose. If taking into consideration the nature of the liability and the circumstances in the light of which the arrangement for the assumption was made, it appears that the principal purpose of the taxpayer with respect to the assumption described in A, was a purpose to avoid federal income tax on the exchange, or if not such purpose, was not for a bona fide business purpose, then such assumption shall, for purposes of 351 or 361, be considered money received by the taxpayer in the exchange. So the B1 exceptions say that normally assuming a liability, will not kick the transaction transaction out of 351 unless there was a tax avoidance purpose or there was not a bona fide business purpose, not a real business purpose. <clears throat> so tax avoidance purpose is something that a key factor in, in de determining if there is a tax avoidance purpose is the length of time the liability has been outstanding. If I incurred the liability to purchase the property that doesn't seem like a tax avoidance purpose, but if I have owned the property for 10 years and I decide to transfer the property to the corporation and I borrow money the day before the transfer so I have cash in my pocket, that looks like a tax avoidance purpose. I, I borrow the money the day before the transfer, I transfer the asset to the corporation and the corporation takes over the liability. That looks like a tax avoidance purpose. All right, and then C, Liabilities in excess of basis. In general, in the case of an exchange to which 351 applies or 361 applies, with respect to stock, if the sum of the amount of the liabilities assumed exceeds the total of the adjusted basis of the property transferred pursuant to such exchange, then such exchange shall be considered as a gain from the sale or exchange of a capital asset or of property which is not a capital asset as the case may be. So if the corporation assumes liabilities that are greater than the total adjusted basis of the property transferred, there will be a gain recognized. <clears throat> the only exception to this is found in C3, which is not up on your slide. It says that there's an exception found in C3 that provides an exclusion if the liability would allow a deduction when paid. So if it's a cash basis taxpayer with an account payable, there's no tax basis in that liability anyway. So that will operate outside the provisions of three, of C, excuse me. <clears throat> Jim owns 80% of gold corporation stock. He transfers a business automobile to gold in exchange for additional gold stock worth $5,000 and gold's assumption of both his $1,000 auto debt and his $2,000 education loan. The automobile originally cost Jim $12,000 and on the transfer date has a $4,500 adjusted basis and an $8,000 fair market value. A, what are the amount and character of Jim's recognized gain or loss? So in part A, Jim is going to recognize some income. He 
realizes a $3,500 gain and recognizes a $3,000 gain because the education loan has no, there's no reason Gold Corporation, there's no business reason Gold Corporation should assume that loan. So because the $2,000 education loan assumed by Gold has no apparent business purpose, all the liabilities transferred to Gold are treated as boot under Section 357B. So all of Jim's gain is ordinary because of Section 1245. B, what's Jim's basis in his additional gold shares? <clears throat> so it's $4,500. All right, it is his transferred basis plus gain realized, and excuse me, plus gain recognized minus boot property. So it's $4,500. C, when does Jim's holding period for the additional shares begin? Jim's holding period for the shares includes his holding period for the automobile, so it's a transfer holding period. And then D, what basis does gold take in the automobile? He takes a $7,500 basis. It's the, or gold is the corporation. Gold takes a $7,500 basis. It's the transferred basis plus the gain recognized, $7,500. Okay, and this is also in your book. It's a nice summary of Section 351. And so it starts with transfers and goes on to transferees. For transfer ors, the gain realized, if it is a taxable property transfer, which if it's a taxable property transfer to a corporation, that means Section 351 did not apply. So that first column is when 351 doesn't apply. The second column is when 351 does apply. So the gain realized is going to be the same in both transactions. <clears throat> the gain recognized, however, is going to be different. Under a taxable property transfer, we generally recognize the total amount of the gain. But on a non-taxable property transfer, that's the point of 351, to not recognize gain. So our general rule is we don't recognize gain unless one of the exceptions applies. That's A, B, C, and D in your chart. Boot is received. Liabilities are transferred to the corporation for a non-business or tax avoidance purpose. Liabilities exceed basis are transferred to the corporation. Or D, services, certain corporate debt, and interest claims are transferred to the corporation. Three, the basis of the property received. If it's a taxable property transfer, the basis that the transfer or takes in any assets received is the fair market value basis. The basis in a non-taxable property transfer starts with a transferred basis to that. I'm going to add gain recognized, and I'm going to subtract money received and the fair market value of non-cash boot property received. And the holding period, if it is a taxable transfer, is going to happen, is going to begin the day after the exchange date. If it is a non-taxable property transfer, the holding period of the stock received is going to be transferred. It's going to include the holding period of 1231 property or capital assets transferred. If it is any other type of property that's transferred, it's going to begin the day after the exchange date. <clears throat> now looking at the transfer e corporation, the gain recognized in a taxable property transfer is none. There's no gain or loss recognized when a corporation issues its stock. Same result in a non-taxable property transfer. But the basis is going to change. The basis under a taxable property transfer is going to be the fair market value of the assets received. And in a non-taxable property transfer, we're going to start with the transfer or's basis plus any gain recognized by the transferor. The only Time that may not be true is in the case of liabilities that exceed basis. So if the total adjusted basis of all transferred property exceeds the total fair market value of the property, the total basis to the transfer or is limited to the property's total fair market value. And the holding period in a taxable property transfer begins the day after the exchange date. In a non-taxable transfer, the transfer or's carryover holding period for the property is transferred regardless of the property's character. And it's the day after the exchange date if the basis is reduced to the fair market value. We also need to deal with depreciation. 
If no gain is recognized because of section 351, no depreciation is gonna be recaptured in the transaction. However, it is gonna be preserved to the transfer e-corporation and will be recaptured at disposal. So if, if I, as a individual, own property that I depreciate, that it would, would be subject to 1231, and then recapture by 1245 or 1250, when I transfer it to the corporation, if 351 applies and there's no gain or loss, there's gonna be no recapture at the time of, of transfer, but that will be preserved to the corporation, so when they sell the asset, there will be recapture. If there is a partial gain recognized in the transaction, partial recapture is going to occur and the rest is going to be preserved. And if the transferee corporation will continue depreciating the asset in the same manner as the transfer or. In the year of transfer, the month of the exchange is allocated solely to the transferee regardless of the date of the exchange in computing depreciation. So they're going to start depreciating in the month of transfer. All right, so remember in section 351, we had to receive solely stock, not debt. So some corporations attempted to disguise debt as equity. So section 385 controls whether the security that the transfer or received is debt or equity. The title is not controlling. So here are some the factors in section 385. Whether there is a written unconditional promise to pay on demand or a, on a specified date a certain sum of money in return for adequate consideration in the form of money or money's worth in addition to an unconditional promise to pay a fixed rate of interest. So that looks like debt. Whether the debt is subordinate to or preferred over other debt of the corporation. The ratio of corporate debt to equity. Whether the debt is convertible into stock of the corporation and the relationship between holdings of stock in the corporation and holdings of the interest in question. <clears throat> All right, now looking at debt capital. If section 351 is satisfied and there's no gain or loss recognition, if the transfer or receives corporate debt in return though, it's gonna be a taxable transaction. And interest payments are generally deductible to the corporation, but they're limited if the C corporation has gross receipts greater than $25 million. In that case, the interest payments are going to be limited to the greater limited to the sum of, that should say, business interest income, 30% of adjusted taxable income, and floor plan financing interest for corporate taxpayers who sell motor vehicles. If the interest is limited, it can be carried forward indefinitely. And the extinguishment of debt is generally not taxable unless the amount received differs from its base value or adjusted basis. So this adjusted taxable income slide relates to the limits to deductibility of interest payments. It's number two, 30% of adjusted taxable income. This is how we define adjusted taxable income. A C corporation calculates its taxable income without regard to any item of income, gain, deduction, or loss not properly allocable to a trade or business. So mostly I think of investments. If a C Corp has invested in something, any items of income, gain, deduction, or loss as a result of that in investment will not be figured into the adjusted taxable income. Number two, any business interest or business interest income. Three, any net operating loss deduction. And four, any deduction allowable for depreciation, amortization, amortization, or depletion taken in years before 2022. When we issue equity as a corporation, we do give away some ownership percentage in the company, and dividend payments are not deductible to the corporation, which as a equity holder, the only way to receive a return on my investment is to sell the share or to receive dividends. There are other advantages and disadvantages that are going to be discussed later in this course of issuing equity versus debt. And we also have the double taxation problem, but we try to mitigate that by the dividends received deduction, which we'll also talk about in the next chapter. 
All right, 2-48. Um, Kobe transfers $500,000 in cash to a newly formed Bryant Corporation for 100% of Bryant's stock. In the first year of operations, Bryant's taxable income before any payments to Kobe is $120,000. What total amount of taxable income must Kobe and Bryant each report in the following two scenarios? A. Bryant pays a $70,000 dividend to Kobe. All right, so in part A, when Bryant pays a $70,000 dividend to Kobe, that is non-deductible to Kobe Corporation. So Kobe has income of 120, taxable income of $120,000 in the first year, and they pay 21% on that income, so they pay $25,200 of tax on that income. When Kobe receives that dividend, that dividend is included in Kobe's gross income. And Kobe will pay their marginal tax rate on that dividend unless a, a lower qualified dividend rate applies, which thinking back to individual income taxes, Kobe will likely get a lower rate on that dividend. It'll be probably the capital gain tax rate for whatever tax bracket Kobe is in. All right, but notice here, we still kind of have the double taxation problem because Bryant Corporation paid tax on the full $120,000 of income. They didn't get to take a deduction for that dividend, and then Kobe had to include it in income. Part B, assume that when Bryant was formed, Kobe transferred his $500,000 to the corporation for $250,000 of stock and $250,000 in notes. So notes are debt. The notes are repayable in five annual installments of $50,000, plus 8% annual interest on the unpaid balance. During the current year, Bryant gives Kobe $50,000 in repayment on the, of the first note, plus $20,000 in interest. All right, so this is a little bit different. When we have debt, the corporation can take a deduction of interest paid on debt, assuming that no other limits apply. So here, in, this, in Part B, in this second scenario, if taxable income before any payments is $120,000, Bryant may reduce that one hundred twenty dollars by the $20,000 of interest that Kobe receives. So the taxable income for Bryant is now only $100,000 and they only pay $21,000 of tax. Also, Kobe will include that $20,000 interest in income, but will not include the $50,000 repayment of capital and in income. Sometimes we might have a capital contribution by a non-shareholder. So they, they give us capital in our corporation, but they don't take shares in return. They might do this to get some advantage, a favor, or something like that. For transfers after December 22, 2017, the term contribution of capital no longer includes contributions to the corporation by non-shareholders who are customers, potential customers, governmental entities, or civic groups. These contributions are now taxable to the corporation to the extent of the fair market value of the property contributed. The corporation then will take a fair market value basis in the property received. Any other contributions to capital by non-shareholders who aren't customers, potential customers, governmental entities, or civic groups will continue to be non-taxable. In this case, the corporation will take a zero basis in the property, which precludes the corporation from claiming depreciation or capital recovery offsets with respect to the property. All right, moving on to worthless securities. Our general rule is we get to take a deduction as a capital loss on the last date of the year in which the security becomes worthless. I invest in a corporation, the corporation files bankruptcy. On the last day of the year, I can take a deduction as a capital loss on the last day of that year. <clears throat> there would be an ordinary loss only in the following situations. The stock is an ordinary asset in the hands of the shareholder rather than a capital asset. They are affiliated corporations or it's Section 1244 stock. So as an individual, I generally like ordinary losses because I can deduct them against all of my income. Remember, I have limits when I deduct capital losses. So as an individual, I, I like this result. A, this one stock is ordinary asset in the hand of a shareholder. So this is 
basically an extension of the general rule. If I have an ordinary asset, I take a loss on that asset, it's an ordinary loss. Or we have affiliated corporations. We're going to talk about affiliated corporations later, I believe, in Chapter 8, so we're not going to really focus on that now. Or it's Section 1244 stock, which Section 1244 stock is stock from a small business corporation to an individual or partner, and it's limited. the deduction is limited to $50,000 or $100,000 if married filing jointly. A small business corporation is a... It must be a small business corporation at the time it issues the stock, and it's a corporation that receives in the aggregate $1 million or less in money or non-cash property in exchange for its stock. It has to have derived more than half of its aggregate gross receipts from active sources, so not passive royalties, rents, dividends, interest, annuities, and gains on the sale of stock and securities. It has to be active sources, during the five most recent tax years, ending before the date on which the shareholder sells or exchanges the stock, or the stock becomes worthless. Tom and Vicki are married and file a joint income tax return. They each purchase 50% of the stock in Guest Corporation from Al for $75,000. Tom is employed full-time by Guest and earns $100,000 in annual salary. Because of Guest's financial difficulties, Tom and Vicki each lend Guest an additional $25,000. The $25,000 is secured by bonds and is repayable in five years, with interest accruing at the prevailing market rate. Guest's financial difficulties escalate, and it eventually declares bankruptcy. Tom and Vicki receive nothing for their Guest stock or Guest bonds. A. What are the amount and character of each shareholder's loss on their worthless stock and bonds? Okay. So Tom and Vicki each have a $75,000 capital loss. The $75,000 with respect to the stock investments is capital and character for both Tom and Vicki because they didn't purchase the stock from the corporation. Because the $25,000 debts are secured by bonds, the worthless security rules apply and their losses will be capital and character. B, how would your answers to part A change if the liability were not secured by the bonds? Okay, so in part B, it would still be a capital loss to Vicky, but it would be an ordinary loss to Tom. Vicky's loan would be related solely to her stock investment and should be treated as a non-business bad debt that is deductible as a short-term capital loss. But since Tom was an employee of the corporation, you could argue that Tom's loss would relate to his attempt to maintain his employment with the corporation and has a business purpose. And since it is a business asset, it would be an ordinary asset. So a loss would be deductible as an ordinary loss because the dominant motive for making it were related to his employment activities. How would your answer to A change if Tom and Vicky purchased their stock for $75,000 each at the time Guest was formed? So it would be a limited ordinary loss on stock and capital loss on the bonds. The loss on this stock would be ordinary under Section 1244 because it's small business stock. It would be ordinary for up to a $100,000 annual limit married filing jointly couple because they purchased the stock directly from guest. The $50,000 that they the $50,000 loss they still incurred beyond the $100,000 limit would be capital in character. The worthless security rules but still apply to the $25,000 losses on the bond investments. They would be capital. <clears throat> All right, moving on to unsecured debts. Unsecured debts are debts that if you do not pay, there is not an asset I can go take. So when I take out a mortgage that and I borrow money to buy a house, that mortgage is secured by my house. If I don't pay my bill, the bank can take my house. Credit cards are unsecured debt. They're a debt that I incur to the credit card, card company, but there's no specific asset they can go foreclose on if I don't pay. So in this situation of an unsecured loan made to a corporation, the tax treatment is going to depend on whether there is a business or a non-business debt. Usually a loan to a corporation by a shareholder is going to be considered non-business, but that presumption can be rebutted. And it matters because a non-business bad debt is treated as a short-term capital loss when it's totally worthless. 
but a business bad debt is going to be treated as an ordinary loss, whether partially or totally worthless. And then what if we want to avoid Section 351 and we want to recognize taxation or tax consequences, either gains or losses in a transaction? Section 351 is not elective. So if we meet it, we have to abide by the non-recognition provisions. So if we, if we don't want to meet it, we have to do something to avoid it. Why would I not want to meet it? Well, maybe I have losses implicit in these assets that I'm transferring to the corporation, and I want to recognize those losses. I might want to recognize them because they're capital losses and I had a lot of capital gains this year. I might want to have a higher basis in my shares, so I might want to recognize those gains to get a higher basis in my shares. And I might also want to recognize a capital gain as an individual because my capital gain rate might be lower than the corporate tax rate. So it might be a good tax planning strategy to recognize the gain as an individual. So if I want to avoid section 367, I can sell the property to the controlling corporation for cash. So instead of taking shares, I can take cash. <coughs> I might also sell the property to the controlled corporation for cash and debt. This would involve less cash than the, the transaction above, but the sale may be treated as a non-taxable exchange if the IRS recharacterizes the debt as equity. Remember, the title is not controlling, those Section 385 factors control. I could also sell the property to a third party for cash and have the third party contribute the property to the corporation for stock. I could have the corporation distribute sufficient boot property so that even if 351 applies, I'll still recognize a portion or all of the gain. The transfer could fail one or more of the 351 tests. So I could transfer property and get just below 80% of the voting stock. The, the control requirement wouldn't have been met, and then I would recognize gain. I could also trigger gain recognition under 357C, which is the liability provisions. I could transfer to the corporation debt that exceeds the basis of all the property transferred, and then I would recognize gain or loss in the transaction. Six years ago, Donna purchased land as an investment. It cost $150,000. It's now worth $480,000. Donna plans to transfer the land to Development Corporation, which will subdivide it and sell it in individual tracts. Development's income on the land sales will be ordinary in character. What are the tax consequences of the asset transfer and land sales if Donna contributes the land in exchange for all of its stock? So this is pretty easy. We should know that. There's no gain or loss because Section 351 applies. The development company's basis in the land is 150. Donna's basis in her shares is 150. Any gain on the sale of the lots, once the corporation divides up the land and sells it as lots, will be ordinary income to the company, the corporation. This results in the pre-contribution gain that accrued prior to Donna's transfer and the post-contribution profit earned from subdividing the land being taxed at a 21% tax rate. Because corporate taxes are now 21% across the board, all of that gain is going to be a 21% tax rate. B, in what alternative ways can the transaction be structured to achieve more favorable tax results? Assume the marginal tax rate for Donna for capital gains is 23.8%, so her 20% rate plus the net investment tax, and development's rate is 21%. So what could Donna do? Well, she could transfer the land to development in exchange for stock and debt. That would blow up Section 351. So in that case, she would recognize $330,000 of long-term capital gain and development spaces in the land would be $480,000 now. The $330,000 of pre-contribution gain is taxed at the capital gains rate, so Donna's, so the 20% plus the 3.8% net investment tax. But the basis now, the $480,000 basis that the corporation takes in the land permits development to use the additional basis to offset income earned from subdividing the land that otherwise would be taxed at 